Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us in our weekly shir for Hasidus in English, Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. right here in Rechavia, Yerushalayim. Thank you to Mordechai and Raya for hosting the shir online and editing it and uploading it onto our YouTube channel. We have, Baruch Hashem, over 500 subscribers to our channel, and we have close to 1,100 videos on our YouTube channel. So you can check out the different playlists, the different events, shiurim that we have, including the Beit Midrash. But there's nothing like coming in person. So we're trying our best to encourage everybody to come in person. And so um, we really highly recommend that you do that. And I'm happy that we're able to bring you this online version, thanks to Mordechai and Ryan. Now we're on page... 83 in your English Sefer of the Essence of Chassidus, which is chapter 16. Last week, we learned a really powerful chapter, which was chapter 15, which discussed the interpretation of Modani according to the teaching of Sod, of uh, the mystical interpretation of of uh, the Torah. And how the teaching of Hasidus blends in so nicely and moreover adds to the explanation of, of Kabbalah. Now that we've finished the four the four main types of interpretations of the, the Modani. Now we're going to explain how all of the four interpretations are connected. In other words, I would like to give you one insight, which hopefully will add a lot, not only to understanding this text, but giving you a, a real meaningful insight into what Hasidus is. We talk about Hasidis, Hasidis, Tanya, the different different um, discourses. And we're saying that now we're learning about the essence of Hasidis. The essence of Hasidis is essence, as we've been saying so many times over the past several shirim. One of the secrets of the Torah is that everything is connected. In other words, you can have a situation where you have individual objects that are similar even. Even though they're similar, they're yet individual, separate. But then you have a scenario where even if things may seem a little separate and a little different, they still are like one. So for example, you'll have... Um, you take off a hundred apples off the fruit tree. They're all apples. They come from the same tree, but they're individual apples. And then you can have a body with two eyes, a nose, fingers, a stomach, everything. And like, what's the connection between an ear and a, and a baby toe? What's the connection? It's a very powerful connection. It's all part of one, one unit. And so we can definitely find the common denominator between all of them, even if they seem different. And so Torah, there might be things which seem different. For example, Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, the, the house of Hillel, so to speak, the yeshiva of Hillel, usually had one way of thinking, thing, of understanding certain things in the Torah. And the house of Shammai the students of Shammai and Shammai himself had, his, had their way of understanding the Torah. So one can say, one second, how do we reconcile? Sometimes they're opposites. One says that it's kosher, another one says that it's non-kosher. So how can they both be right? It's like the joke where two guys come to the rabbi, they're arguing. The rabbi says to the first guy, you're right. The, guy, the, guy, the other guy says what he thinks and the rabbi says, you're right. So the Rebbe comes running, my dear husband, how could they both be right? So he says to her, my dear wife, 
You're also right. And so you have two things, Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai, for example, that can be totally opposite opinions. And they're both part of Torah? Yes, they're both part of Torah. In the halacha, that's something else. The halacha, you got to either you're allowed to do it or you're not allowed to do it. But in theory, the word is not even theory. In in essence, they both have a part of Torah. The question is, halachically speaking, do we go like this one or like that one? So the rabbis rule which one to go by. But let me throw one at you. You have Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai. Who do we usually rule like except for 11 cases? That's right, the house of Hillel. When Mashiach comes, we're going to rule like Shammai. One second, we're going to rule like Shammai. But didn't we just say that Allah is like Hillel and the Torah? Well, and the Torah is right. And what we've been doing up until now, when Mashiach comes, we've been doing the right thing. So what happened now all of a sudden? How does it change from Beit Hillel to Beit Shammai? The answer is that both Hillel and Shammai, or Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, are both Torah. The question is, do most rabbis, do the majority of the Sanhedrin of the of the Supreme Court, do they understand in their seichel, in their intellect, in their logic, like Hillel or like Shammai? So because most people before Mashiach's coming can rationalize better with Hillel, that's part of the rule of, of ruling, of, of, of giving a halachic, halachic ruling. It has to be according to how the majority of the rabbis understand that. So we rule like Hillel. But because Shammai, it's not like, God forbid, it's not part of Torah. It is part of Torah. We just don't rule like him, but it's perfectly like Torah, just like Hillel. So the proof is when Mashiach comes, we're going to rule like Shammai. So what's the point that I'm trying to bring out? The point is that the entire Torah is one unit. Now, if you can understand it by Hillel and Shammai, then you can definitely understand it when it comes to two different parts of the Torah. For example, the Babylonian Talmud, the Talmud Bavli, versus the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. If there is a disagreement bet between them, we can understand that these are two ways of understanding the Torah, they are both they are both part of the Torah, and hopefully we'll understand the depth as much as possible. There's infinite depth to the Torah, and the same thing we can understand when it comes to the revealed part of the Torah versus the mystical interpretation of the Torah. If we understand and we can accept that two opposite opinions are both part of the Holy Torah, not God forbid that the one of them is Torah, the other one is not. No, they're both Torah. So what? Is, is the way of understanding this. So the way we can understand it is that it's the mystical interpretation of the very same Torah. So for example, if you have a, an orange and you have the thick peel of the entire orange, then each piece is surrounded with a, 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 sm a very thin layer, thank you, a very thin layer. And you can... When it comes to an onion, you have several layers, one on top of the other. It's the same onion. The question is, are you looking at it from the most external part, where it has a brown layer, very, very thin layer, or have you peeled off a couple of real heavy pieces till you come to the core of the onion that's the most, the most bitter? It's all the same. So the inside is more perhaps the mystical uh, and the, the more, more of a secret, or for example, we have the pshat, the remez, the rosh and sod. Pshat is a simple meaning. But then a little deeper down, you have the remez, which the remez, as we said earlier, is, is like alluding to something. It's not clear. Then you have the drush, like a medrash, which is even a deeper way of learning. And finally, sod is the, is, is the mystical interpretation of the Torah. That's the Kabbalah. But we've finished clarifying that Hasidus is related to each of the above four. Not only it's related to it, but it adds a lot of meaning and, and, and understanding. In each of the above four ways of understanding the Torah, so now we're going to do the most beautiful thing. 
We're going to tie in all four interpretations of the Moda'ani and, and see how the Hasidic interpretation brings everything together. So it's all one Torah. It's not a beautiful message. Even before we see the details, just understanding the concept hopefully is very uplifting because we realize that it's all one Torah. All one Torah. We're going to see. We're going to see soon. But there, there are other examples of this. But the, the way the Rebbe brings this out is the most beautiful. So let's just for a moment recap what the four interpretations of the Modani is, and basically. It's starting from, we're not going to read it inside, but it's starting from chapter 12 until chapter 15. Each one, each chapter deals with another part of the Torah, another interpretation. So the first, the first interpretation of Pshat was, we'll do this really short, Pshat Hashem. The first interpretation, first let's do the, the meaning. Moda Nilafanecha. I that I thank, I admit, I am appreciative to you, Hashem. Melach Haivakayam, the living and eternal God. Shechzarta binishmati, that you gave me back my neshama, the chemla with compassion. Rabba Munatecha, great is your is my faith in you. So according to the simple meaning is that. Thank you for giving back my, my, my soul. My soul was partially taken away during the night. Now I have my soul back. And so you say thank you, especially that it's a portion of, of, uh, of death. And so when, when the Shama comes back, there's an extra special feeling of appreciation gratitude. and gratitude. Then we talked about the The level of remez, which alludes to um, something deeper, which is the fact that the, here the focus is that death is one sixtieth, that the sleep is one sixtieth of death, and so therefore we talked about the connection between. It's not just a nice uh, analogy, but we talked about in depth how how sleep can really be compared to death and their appreciation and gratitude that we have when our neshama comes back in the morning is much greater. Then we talked about the, the interpretation of drush, which is that when you give something to someone to hold, then, the, then that individual has to give it back to you. So Hashem holds our neshama while we're asleep. So it's not just taken for granted, but it's something which which we have to deeply appreciate that he gave it our neshama back to us. <laughs> Correct. And and finally, salt the secret the 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 uh, mystical interpretation of the Torah is that melech chay v'kayim that we have this the 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 sefira the level of melech which is malchut. And then you have the Chai V'kayim, which is Yesod, and Yesod brings into Malchut the power to recreate and and share with others less fortunate than, than, than it. And so that gives us the power to be able to bring our Neshama back, and therefore we thank Hashem from the depths of our heart. Let's read now on page 83, which is the beginning of chapter 16. Habiurim Shepa Chasidut, the explanations of Chasidut, and the four portions of the Torah explaining the mode uh, of Pshat, simple meaning, Remez alluding, Drush, deeper level. And so the, the mystical interpretation of the Torah, uh, Modani, which is in the passage of Modani, Shurim Zebazet, are connected one to another. Akarata Adam, the recognition of the human being. That the innovation of ex nihilo, that something comes from nothing, comes from the essence of Hashem, which is higher than worlds. We learned about this last week. When we explained 
how Hasidus adds meaning into the portion of the mystical interpretation of the Torah Modani. Mechazeket et ha'akara strengthens the recognition shekol ha'olamot mitchatshim tamid ma'ayin v'efes ha'mochot. It strengthens the recognition that all of the worlds, there are many worlds that Hashem has created that are existent even now. All of these worlds and the spirituals and all of the galaxies that Hashem created every moment are being created ex nihilo from nothing. From total nothing. So when I'm saying a full sentence, I think and you think that it's one full sentence. But it's really be, being split up as I'm speaking and as you're listening, the entire world and the in, everything which is included in the Bereshit Bara Lokim Hashem created the world, Eta Shamay, Meta Aras, the heavens and the earth, are all being recreated literally from nothingness. Habir Bechele Karem Hashem Modani which is the explanation in the Remez of Modani, where we talked about that sleep is one sixtieth of death. Because if the creations of the, of the world, the creation of the world, would have been through Malchut alone, without Yisod pouring into it, that which it's received from above. Since we explained last week that Malchut is within the realm of world, worldly matters, unlike all of the nine levels above, there would not be any novelty in the essence of their being. Kim only. Only like, like what the neshama gives life to the body. Even without life of the neshama, it has an existence. What's the proof that the body has its own existence aside from the neshama? At first glance, you know, the neshama makes the body alive. Answer is, there are two proofs, very simple proofs. First of all, when Hashem created all of the beings, Hashem created the body of the plants or whatever, the tree, whatever it is, with the neshama. But when it came to the human being, first he, first he made a body, a corpse. And then he infused breath into the body through its nostrils. He blew into his nostrils a breath of life. So... It, it was there. It was. It was an ex the body was in existence even before the neshama came into the picture. The same thing is after 180 when the neshama leaves the body, the body still remains. It might dissolve, but it has its own uh, uh, life force. What what does the neshama do? The neshama connects, gives gives energy that that the that the the life force that the body has on its own should be able to stay and shouldn't wither away. But nonetheless, even though it's not such a strong source of of of, uh, exist, of, of, of of energy, the body still has its own source of energy beyond the energy. So, do you want to say that there's a real, is, is the neshama bringing into the body a really new love? Without it, it would also it would also be a little bit okay. Middle of the second to last line. Aval Since the creation, the entire creation of of the world is from the essence of, excuse me, please, is from the essence of the infinite God. Blessed be He. She'ein ha'olamot. Now I'm on 87. That the worlds don't take, don't come into the picture at all. So they're not really taking up any space over here. The main existence becomes renewed at every moment 
from the essential infinite God. Let's turn back to page 82. Beginning of this chapter. Chassidus at the link between all levels of interpretation because it's all one Torah. The Hasidic explanations of the four levels of Pardis, which is an abbreviation for the four different levels of Torah, in Modani are all interrelated. A person's realization that the creating of something from nothing comes from the essence of the or ain't self infinite God, which transcends all the worlds, which is the explanation of the esoteric interpretation of Modani, the Sod intensifies his awareness of the individual that all the worlds are constantly being created from utter nothings. Which is the interpretation of Remes of Modani. So we're connecting interpretation number four with interpretation number two. Excuse, uh, excuse me. Correct. As it's it's in a, in a great sense a new song. It's almost like saying you can do a car wash or a car scrub. You could say it's a new car, but it's not really a new car. But the scrub is not just you know a car wash. You go and you scrub with your hands and you make sure that it's all clean. It's a much greater level of novelty, of 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 novel. With all humility, with all humbleness, tomorrow morning at eleven, we're going to be giving Bezrat Hashem a really powerful shear on Zoom, in connection with with uh, Eretz Yisrael. And the reason why I'm mentioning it now, I was going to mention it after the class. But uh, this point is very much connected with what we're going to say about partial cleansing. I'm trying to capture this in five words or less. And between total cleansing. It's going to be very powerful. The title, to, I'm going to send it the message on, on the, the tomorrow morning. But the, the tomorrow's Tomorrow's class, you might want to send it to all your friends. Tomorrow's class is called is called Crushing Hamas and Flattening Gaza. So it's gonna be it's gonna be loaded. The loaded class. What? I know where you stand. Huh. But, but when when you hear the class, you'll hear meaning and explanation and it's 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 a fascinating it's not mine. I'm just giving it over. It's it's it's, it's uh, I I put it together from different parts of the Torah, and it's going to be fascinating. So it's highly encouraged to watch it. So it's our series of war Israel at war that Mordechai and Rai are putting together, and every Wednesday. So Baruch Hashem. I just figured I'll put in a plug over there for that for that share tomorrow morning. Rabbi Diamond's at ten, and I'm at eleven. Okay. For if the worlds had been brought, top, top line of 84. For if the worlds had been brought into being by the attribute of Malchut alone, and not from the essence of Ari himself through all of the above Sfirot until Yisod, then since the worlds are of significance to and have a relationship with Malchut by its very nature, there could not be this totally new creation of their very existence, ex nihilo. The vivification of the worlds were, were they to be brought into existence from Malchut alone, would rather be an anal analogous. analogous, thank you, to the way in which the soul gives life to the body. For even without the life force of the soul, the body possesses its own existence. Since, however, 86, Creation comes from the essence of the Orient Sof in relation to which the worlds have no ground or significance whatsoever. There is hence utterly no basis for them at all. 
and even their elementary existence must be constantly created anew in the light of the Ein Sof at every moment, every nanosecond. So this brings us to the next paragraph. Excuse me, please. Upemela, and therefore, akarata achdut, the person comes to the level of recognizing the achdut, the the unity of Hashem in the world. But often she'ain od milvado, that there's nothing else in the world. You look around, you see it looks like there's a hat, a tablecloth, a table, chairs, uh, uh, a phone, sparin, food. It looks like there's different things. But when we realize that every single object in the world is being recreated every second from total garnished nothingness, then that gives us a much greater recognition, the fact that there's nothing but Hashem. It's not just that Hashem keeps things in existence. He recreates them from nothing, from, from zilch. So we're going from pre-existence to... Simultaneously. It's unbelievable. When you think about this, and you can think about it more and more, but this point that we're talking about, the more you the more you learn about it, the more you have that wow, how awesome Hashem is, how little we are, and how grateful we can be that Hashem gives us the privilege of being connected to him. Us little nothingnesses can be connected to Hashem. So when you have the recognition of Enod Milvado, that there's nothing in the world besides for Hashem, Shekol Ha'olamot, that all of the worlds, Hain Ayin Ve'efes Mamash, are literally nothingness. In reference to Hashem, the Almighty Blessed Be, they don't even have any name. It's not even considered another thing. It's nothing. So it's not, it's, it's pre existence a nothing or something. What do you mean? We, we say nothingness. But what we're saying is we're going from pre-existence to existence. Continue. Correct. So is pre-existence nothingness or somethingness? Um, first of all, it's nothingness in relation to what's going to be created in a moment or in a, the next nanosecond. Nonetheless, the fact is that there is a world. So when I hold my hat, is this an illusion or is it real? According to what I just said, it's nothing, nothing or nothingness. And the answer to the question, the answer to the question lies in this. So on, on a great level, it's nothing. But practically speaking, it's something. Mm -hmm. This is not an illusion. Hashem created a world. What's the biggest proof that the world is really in existence? Because the Torah says, for heaven's sakes, Bereshit, bara alukim, et It says Hashem created heaven and earth. Isn't that a pretty good, isn't that the best testimony that there is a heaven and earth and the heaven and earth is not an illusion and everything else that's in it? So how do we, how do we reconcile between the two? On one hand, you're telling me that Hashem is the true existence and everything else is nothingness. On the other hand, you tell me that all the stuff that's happening in the world is not just nothingness. It's quite uh, real. Can't think of this appearance. Okay, you're saying something very, very strong. <clears throat> so since it can become nothingness, because the world is totally dependent on Hashem at every single moment, 
so without Hashem, it's nothing. So for example, if the metal is whole, the table is made up of plastic on top and the metal, it's, they're both the metal and happened to be bolted in, but let's say they were not bolted, excuse me, and somebody takes away the legs, what's going to happen to the plate of plastic? It's going to fall down. In other words, it's not going to be a table anymore. End of conversation. So on a much, much deeper level, you have this concept of Hashem creating the world. At every moment, Hashem is mechadesh. We say it in davening, two paragraphs before, before the Shema. It's a pasuk, it's a verse. What do we say in the pasuk? We say, HaMechadesh b'tuvo b'chol yom tamid He who innovates in his kindness every single day and every moment, tamid constantly, Maseh Bereshit, the creation of the world. So it's every single moment. When we think of that, we realize that the world, in a great sense, is nothingness. It's real. But listen to these words, please, really clearly. The entire world is a godly world. It's not just technically, oy vey, if Hashem takes away the spark of godliness from the legs of this table, then the table, then the plastic is going to come flying down. That's a backwards way of looking at it. It's true. But it's it's not it's not backwards. It's not looking at the essence. What is the what is the essence? That this table is a godly table. It's Hashem. Hashem created it. And Hashem continues to create it every moment. So does it have a, a being? It's all godly. The problem is that we don't see the godliness. That's our problem. Not Hashem's problem and not the world's problem. It's our problem that we don't see it. But a tzaddik who has laser, spiritual laser vision, is able to see within every object the spiritual spark, which is the true existence of the, of the materialistic yes. object. And when Mashiach comes, the kol basar yachdav, the flesh will see. What does that mean? That's not just that we, our eyes of flesh, are going to see godliness within every object. It's so moreover, it's almost as if to say that there's going to be eyes, not literal eyes, but there will be some kind of vision in the flesh, in the object of the world. Every single object is going to recognize God. Wow. That's, that means that we're in a godly world. The problem is we're a million steps behind. We don't, we don't, but that's our problem. So that's why we're here at a, at a Hasidus class, learning about it, learning what we should understand. And it's like anything else in the world. When you start learning, you don't know almost anything about it. The more you learn, the more it becomes real. That's why it's so important to learn Hasidus because the teachings of Hasidus make it make these deep, seemingly remote concepts real to us in a, in a very special way. What was your question? Is this what Abraham perceived? Did he see it? I'm not sure. Good question. He was a tzaddik. I'm not sure if he if he saw the uh, he broke all the idols. So he had a very deep uh, understanding. He was against the whole world. Literally. Um, it could be. I'm not sure. The whole concept of tzaddikim before the giving of the Torah was, especially before Avram, was a very, very lofty concept. It, was, it wasn't like a tzaddik that we know today. They weren't even Jewish per se, halachically speaking at least. It was only after the giving of the Torah where they became Jewish. So how would you say Adam, Noah, Tushelach, Chanoch? These were great tzaddikim that lived before Abraham Avinu. And so they were very, very holy neshamot. And I would not be surprised if they did have the power to see the spirituality within every object. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. So I, I can't make the, these things up. The Kabbalistic uh, um, concepts have to be have to be real hard facts and not uh, not nice theories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. This is heavy stuff. What do you mean? Please say it again. 
<clears throat> think Abraham was that time in the history of the earth. We uh, focused on what was right in front of him. For example, the actual existence rather than City. It could be they knew they knew the Chassidic definition as well. I'm not sure. Middle of the middle paragraph. Since that's the situation, so it's felt by him in a most simple and basic way. Shachayut b'sari eno shul matziut klal that the flat the 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 human life the 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 life of 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 the flesh is not really in existence. Gam lo matziut erch tafel it's not it's even not considered a secondary. It's nothing nothingness. U matziut what makes someone real real existence? Girak hit kasher belukot. It's only bonding with Hashem. Because Hashem is the real existence. Hashem is the only one that's like the Ramban Nachman and he says, is mechuyav ha-metziyot. Beautiful way to say it. Mechuyav ha-metziyot. He's the only one that it has to be that he's a, he is in existence. Everything else, nothing else in the world has a proof, has a, 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 has a reason to say that they have to be. Only Hashem is the only one. Excuse me, please. Hashem is the only one who is who has the beer, so to speak. And so, if you want to count, if you want to be part of that truth, that real existence, not Coca-Cola the real thing, Torah the real thing, Hashem the real thing, you want to be part of the real thing? So the more you're connected to Hashem, the more you get from Him, this life, this feeling of true existence. Something that's true, always was, is, and always will be. So if something, I don't want to call it fake, but any other being in the world which claims to be part of the world, you want to be real? The more you connect to Hashem, who is truly real, you are also considered to be Real, to some extent. O canal the beer of Hasidus for Helik of Shachim Modani, like we said earlier, in the explanation of Hasidus and the simple meaning of the Modani, which is the first interpretation. Now we're going to get to the, to the we're, we're just missing the third. Next paragraph, and from this recognition that there's nothing else in the world besides for Hashem, it's simple by him, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a given. That with fulfilling the command of Hashem, you cannot mix in any reason or any per- other purpose. The whole kiyumam and the entire um, uh, sustenance it has to come from Hashem. From- in the portion of Drush of, of Modani. Okay, let's learn the Rabbi, what is the homiletic interpretation? That's like Drush, like the Medrash. It's also a deeply we have Medrash for many of the Psukim, and it gives very, very deep. It's not as deep as the esoteric level, like the Sod. But it's still like the Kabbalah, but it still is deeper than than the the, the, the basic interpretation of the term. I don't know. Um, what are we here? Okay. Sure. Not sure. Okay. The truth is the divine Torah. Uh, you could say so. You could say so. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes we call it a, a drash or a drasha. That's nice. Okay. Second paragraph on page 86. And consequently, one comes to realize and appreciate the oneness of God in which there is nothing else besides him, that all the worlds are complete nothingness in relation to the Holy One, blessed be he, and are not called by any name at all. They didn't have a name. They're like nothing, like air, like uh, 
uh, what's called Lucite. <laughs> There's a guy that, that, that runs for the elections over here. He goes, the people that vote for me are not are not uh, Lucite. Uh, I care about them. <laughs> not even the name Od, which is else. In other words, in addition to. Which is an expression indicating secondary, sub subordinate status. The campaign in which... Correct. There is no addition. So... Because it's completeness. Correct. So the only way you can be counted as something is the more you connect to Hashem, who is the true essence, the true being in the world. One therefore senses as something obvious and elementary that the life of the uh, of the flesh has no real existence at all. Not even a second, a secondary or subordinate kind of existence. And real existence, quote unquote, the real is only the connection to the divinity. The word is state of pre-existence. I don't know. I guess it depends which day of the week we are, what what the situation is, and everyone can decide for themselves. You know, every nanosecond is changing, but a person has a, a choice to be to be either to run their own life or to be connected to Hashem. As they say, don't get in the way. Let Hashem carry out His plan and just uh, let's let's get tagged along. So, and existence is only the connection to divinity, as was discussed earlier in the Hasidic explanation of the plain "quote unquote" meaning of Modani, which is interpreted in number one. So far, we have we have one, two, and four. Now we're going to do the last paragraph, number three. Does it help to study this with vodka? A hundred percent. It's like when you say the first l'chaim, when you say the second l'chaim, it spins the other way. Don't ask me what happens when you drink the third l'chaim. And from the realization that there is nothing else besides him, Hashem, it becomes plainly evident to the person that in fulfilling the commandment of Hashem, it is not possible to inject, even as something secondary, any other reason or purpose. The entire observance of the commandments should be because they are the will of the Creator. Period. End of conversation. Because when you're talking about anything but the essence of Hashem, so there are a lot of explanations, interpretations, and it's, it's, it's okay. It's per perfectly legitimate. But you want to get to Hashem's essence because it's thanks to the essence of Hashem that our new neshama comes down every morning. So then just, just connect to him higher than rationale. Don't try to get into the... Into the I'm, not, I'm, not, I, I'm not undermining any other part of the Torah. I'm just saying that, I'm just trying to emphasize that when you want to connect to the essence of Hashem, go straight there. Don't, don't, don't beat around the bush. Because it happens whether you don't ever say it, you wake up there it is. And it's that first moment that you say the Modani. You know that you do not. It's all words, at least for the male version of the day. Years later, I don't know how easy, but the doctor said you should count to 12 for getting up. Yes. We, we, we said it at the, uh, in the first year. Ah. Thank you. Okay, it's 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 uh, and it's all in the Torah. Yeah, everything, all the science, you just have to find it. But you'll find it. Last two lines of this page. This is, as was explained earlier, the Hasidic explanation of the Drush, the homiletic interpretation of Modan. So, in summary of this chapter, that we have a beautiful thread tying together all four interpretations. Of of the Hasidic interpretation to the Modani, anywhere from I guess starting from the last one because that's the clearest as far as the Hasidic explanation is, is concerned that the neshama has the neshama has been created or brought down or, or recreated from total nothingness which comes from the essence of Hashem Malchut becomes united with the Ein Sof the infinite essence of Hashem, and therefore that gives the ability for the Neshama to be reborn and to become re-energized back here in this world, which is, which emphasizes the second interpretation, which is that it's really almost like Tchiyatamitim, like the revival of the dead. It's, it's not just a nice a nice concept, but it's mamish. It's, it's very, very similar. 
and um, which that connects us to the first interpretation that Modani, I'm thanking you, Hashem. It's a simple meaning. Because as the Chassid is, because my whole being, who is me? Who am I? My Neshama. So Modani, I am thanking you because I, my Neshama is connected to the essence of Hashem. So that ties nicely into the other, what we just said. And uh, finally, that it's self-understood to the individual that because what brought my neshama back into existence is the essence of Hashem. Therefore, I go, I connect directly to the essence of Hashem without beating around the bush and trying to find some all kinds of logic and other interpretations, but directly and beautifully connected uh, to, to Hashem, to the Ein Sof. And so thinking of all this hopefully emphasizes two things. First of all, that the Torah is all connected. All the parts of the Torah are connected. It's all one Torah. And even though they seem to be different interpretations, there's a way to connect everything, even when things seem to be opposites and different. And second of all, our whole uh, our whole view of ourselves, of the world around us, becomes a spirit, an all spiritual world. It becomes a world which it might seem to be separated from 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 divinity and godliness, but in fact, every single object in the world and everything about creation is all divine. It's Hashem's world, it's a beautiful world, and it's our job to reveal the unity and the uniqueness of the world. So what do you think gratitude is I think the gratitude, the question was, what does gratitude mean to Hashem? I'm not sure. I think that uh, gratitude, Hashem doesn't need our gratitude per se, because He is so great, He's so awesome, that whatever we're going to say, whatever we're going to do means literally nothing. Nonetheless, in Hashem's infinite wisdom, He Himself teaches us to have gratitude. And that through having gratitude and humility, we can reach the greatest levels ever possible. So, the gratitude would be recognition. No. Hashem. Hashem. Is something important. It's very important. It's very important because that, that's the ABC. That 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 shows that that a person is not an egotist, rather is someone who feels humble and wants to listen, wants to learn wants to share. And when a person has gratitude, then you have basically everything. You're able to learn. It's the opposite of what everyone thinks. Everyone thinks that the more of a big shot I am, the better I am able to learn. Answer is exactly opposite. Someone who is, let's not talk about the negative, let's talk about the positive. Someone who is humble is able to accept from everyone as opposed to someone who's the opposite of that. Can't take from anyone. No one wants to listen to them. No one wants to be part of them. And so, the more modern, beautiful message of modani throughout the entire day until you go to sleep, and then the next morning come re-energize and continue the special service of Hashem. Yes, Thank you very much all for joining us. Uh, this shir is uh, in honor of Rafua Shalema of Chavalea Bat Chayesara, and also in the in the zechut and the merit of the soldier in the IDF, uh, Moshe David ben Chavalea. And uh, amongst all of the soldiers who need our zechuyot, our merits, so hopefully we, we brought a lot of bracha to them. Can I say something? Can I say something? You're frozen. Can I say something? Sure. Mommy? Okay, so, yeah. Wow. One second. I have to <laughs> introduce you. It is a great zechut. I know them all. Here. I know everybody. I, I, I'm I know, but I'm 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 so humbled that my mother is listening to my share live. This is like the greatest feeling in the world. And I and 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 like Hanoch just said, I I feel like like gratitude to you for for for, for everything. And, and I'm humbled that you're listening to I should listen to your share. You should be giving the so share. 
No, not really, because you're talking about very deep stuff. But can I talk for two minutes? Of course. Can I of share? course. Wow. Okay, so two so two things. You spoke about um gratitude and what our avoided does to Hashem. So my mind is brought back to a mimer that I'm sure you've learned with your community, which is the Yiddish mimer from the Free Dikarebbe, the Ata Kadesh Yeshev Al Tehilas Yisrael, that the Rabbi Shalom, who is called Kadesh Hashem, Yeshev Al Tehilas Yisrael, and we say the the Free Dikarebbe, the previous Rebbe, explains that Yeshev means we are mefarnes, like Hashem's parnasa comes from the tehillahs, from the praises that we give to Hashem. So the story that's told in that mimer is of the Baal Shem Tov, who used to go around before he was known as a great tzaddik. He used to go around from town to town, and he used to elicit the responses of the townsfolk, men, women, and children, depending on what they did, Baruch Hashem, and Yertz Hashem, um, Halavai Viter, whatever it is, all those kinds of whatever you say is all good. He just wanted to do that because Hashem loves when we thank him, when we show gratitude. And it says that that's the Parnasa of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, however we want to understand what that concept of Parnasa is. The other thing that I wanted to say, so Hashem is Yashev, Al Tehillah Yisrael. We say it every Shabbos afternoon, and the Tehillim, whenever it is, we say that pasuk. Then I have a Tehillim share um, in Toronto every Tuesday morning, and today we started Perak Nun Base is fifty two, and we were learning. And the Mephorshim there explained us some very interesting things. We just did the introduction. But the word doag, we understand that. So doag, he had a problem. And I know my son doesn't like to talk negative. But doag was a very big Talmud Chacham. But he learned Torah as as an intellectual pursuit. It doesn't it didn't affect his midos. So when we learn something, we have to learn it in a way as Hashem is teaching me how to act and how to behave. So Dog Hadomi's moral compass was compromised because he learned Torah in a way of an intellect as opposed to or in contrast to connecting to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. So I asked the ladies that I spoke to, the word doe comes from the Hebrew word lidog. What does lidog mean? It means to worry. What's the opposite of worrying? So doeg was a worrier. Why was he a worrier? Because his tyra didn't lead him to a relationship with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. What is the opposite of worrying, of, of daga? What's the opposite? Confident. Bitachan. Is bitachan. So on one side of the coin, you have dog hadomi, that he was a worrier through and through. On the other side, you have David HaMalach, and the word David means love. I didn't know this until I prepared for this year. So David, through his Limud HaTayra, he came to the deepest level of love to a Kaddish Baruch Hu and connection and bitachan, that everything that Hashem sends to us is all for the good. It should be Tov HaNira V'Hanigla. What's the last yeah. line of that Perak Zerulach? Tov Hatov Hanira Haganos. That I, I, you all learned this parak um, of Tanya of Yeris Akoidish with my son at the beginning of COVID. I know it's on his um, on the YouTube channel, so I can advertise for that too, which I do. Do I tell people to Thank if they you. want to learn that parak to go to Rechavad um, of YouTube channel for this year. But the point of that shear, the point of that parak, as I understand it, and I learned it way back then, is that when Hashem sends us challenging times, it means that it's coming from such a tremendously high place that to our naked eye, it appears to be not ra, but really it's ta it's tapping in to tov haganus haelyon 
to some place that we should only see the goodness. It shouldn't I mean, be gunners anymore. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be in a way that we don't understand it or grasp it anymore. It should be clear that Hashem is bringing us goodness, and that's, that's for right. everybody and all of the soldiers and all of the that's people, right. I mean, Yiddish people all over the world. I mean, that's exactly what I meant, mommy, that you should be giving a share. <laughs> <laughs> now you all understand, all of you in Zoom and all of you that are here in person. Thank you to both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely to him. <laughs> um, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.